Welcome back to the Reminiscences of the Stock Operator audiobook. In this short video, we're going to share chapter three and four. Really cool chapters, guys, because in this chapter, such very important topics are discussed, such as the problem of constantly getting in and out of the trades in a different type of market environment where this may not be a desirable strategy. The author compares that to the strategy of anticipating the bigger move or what he calls what's going to happen in a big way. This chapter is also cover important information such as trading with real account compared to paper account, learning from taking losses, beating the market at the game of stocks compared to just beating the shop, importance of developing a strategy and clearly understanding what not to do is just as important as understanding what to do and why. Guys, enjoy, take some notes, and take your trading game to the next level. If you have any questions about trading stocks and options, just simply click the link below, get more information. Oh, and by the way, if you want a free copy of the actual book, just follow the links below. I would be happy to email you a free digital copy. It takes a man a long time to learn all the lessons of all his mistakes. They say there are two sides to everything, but there is only one side to the stock market. And it's not the bull side or the bear side, but the right side. It took me longer to get that general principle fixed firmly in my mind than it did most of the more technical phases of the game of stock speculation. I've heard of people who amuse themselves conducting imaginary operations in the stock market to prove with imaginary dollars how right they are. Sometimes these ghost gamblers make millions. It's very easy to be a plunger in that way. It's like the old story of the man who was going to fight a duel the next day. His second asked him, Are you a good shot? Well, said the duelist, I can snap the stem of a wine glass at 20 paces. And he looked modest. That's all very well, said the unimpressed second. But can you snap the stem of a wine glass while the wine glass is pointing a loaded pistol straight at your heart? With me, I must back my opinions with my money. My losses have taught me that I must not begin to advance until I am sure I shall not have to retreat. But if I cannot advance, I do not move at all. I do not mean by this that a man should not limit his losses when he is wrong. He should. But that should not breed indecision. All my life I have made mistakes. But in losing money, I have gained experience and accumulated a lot of valuable don'ts. I have been flat broke several times but my loss has never been a total loss. Otherwise, I wouldn't be here now. I always knew I would have another chance and that I would not make the same mistake a second time. I believed in myself. A man must believe in himself and his judgment if he expects to make a living at this game. It took me five years to learn to play the game intelligently enough to make big money when I was right. I didn't have as many interesting experiences as you might imagine. I mean, the process of learning how to speculate does not seem very dramatic at this distance. I went broke several times, and that is never pleasant. But the way I lost money is the way everybody loses money who loses money in Wall Street. Speculation is a hard and trying business, and a speculator must be on the job all the time, or he'll soon have no job to be on. My task, as I should have known after my early reverses at Fullerton's, was very simple to look at speculation from another angle. But I didn't know that there was much more to the game than I could possibly learn in the bucket shops. There, I thought I was beating the game when in reality, I was only beating the shop. At the same time, the tape reading ability that trading in bucket shops developed in me and the training of my memory have been extremely valuable. Both of these things came easy to me. I owe my early success as a trader to them and not to brains or knowledge because my mind was untrained and my ignorance was colossal. The game taught me the game, and it didn't spare the rod while teaching. I remember my very first day in New York. I told you how bucket shops, by refusing to take my business, drove me to seek reputable commission house. One of the boys in the office where I got my first job was working for Harding Brothers, members of the New York Stock Exchange. I arrived in this city in the morning, and before one o'clock that same day, I had opened an account with the firm and was ready to trade. I didn't explain to you how natural it was for me to trade there exactly as I had done in the bucket shops, where all I did was to bet on fluctuations and catch small but sure changes in prices. 
Nobody offered to point out the essential differences or set me right. If somebody had told me my method would not work, I nevertheless would have tried it out to make sure for myself. For when I am wrong, only one thing convinces me of it, and that is to lose money. And I'm only right when I make money. That is speculating. They were having some pretty lively times those days, and the market was very active. That always cheers up a fellow. I felt at home right away. There was the old familiar quotation board in front of me, talking a language that I had learned before I was 15 years old. There was a boy doing exactly the same thing I used to do in the front office I ever worked at. There were the customers, same old bunch looking at the board or standing by the ticket, calling out the prices and talking about the market. The machinery was to all appearances the same machinery that I was used to. The atmosphere was the atmosphere I had breathed since I had made my first stock market money, $3.12 in Burlington. The same kind of ticker and the same kind of traders, therefore the same kind of game. And remember, I was only 22. I suppose I thought I knew the game from A to Z. Why shouldn't I? I watched the board and saw something that looked good to me. It was behaving right. I bought 100 at 84. I got out at 85 in less than a half hour. Then I saw something else I liked, and I did the same thing. Took three quarters of a point net within a very short time. I began well, didn't I? Now mark this. On that, my first day as a customer of a reputable stock exchange house, and only two hours of it at that, I traded in 1,100 shares of stock, jumping in and out. And the net result of the day's operations was that I lost exactly $1,100. That is to say, on my first attempt, nearly one half of my stake went up the flu. And remember, some of the trades showed me a profit, but I quit $1,100 minus for the day. It didn't worry me, because I couldn't see where there was anything wrong with me. My moves also were right enough, and if I had been trading in the old Cosmopolitan shop, I'd have broken better than even. That the machine wasn't as it ought to be, my 1100 vanished dollars plainly told me, but as long as the machinist was all right there, was no need to stew. Ignorance at 22 isn't a structural defect. After a few days, I said to myself, I can't trade this way here. The ticker doesn't help as it should. But I let it go at that without getting down to bedrock. I kept it up, having good days and bad days, until I was cleaned out. I went to old Fullerton and got him to stake me to $500. And I came back from St. Louis, as I told you with money I took out of the bucket shops there, a game I could always beat. I played more carefully and did better for a while. As soon as I was in easy circumstances, I began to live pretty well. I made friends and had a good time. I was not quite 23, remember, all alone in New York with easy money in my pockets and the belief in my heart that I was beginning to understand the new machine. I was making allowances for the actual execution of my orders on the floor of the exchange and moving more cautiously. But I was still sticking to the tape, that is, I was still ignoring general principles. And as long as I did that, I could not spot the exact trouble with my game. We ran into the big boom of 1901, and I made a great deal of money, that is, for a boy. You remember those times? The prosperity of the country was unprecedented. We not only ran into an era of industrial consolidations and combinations of capital that beat anything we had had up to that time, but the public went stock mad. In previous flush times, I've heard, Wall Street used to brag of 250,000 share dates, when securities of a par value of $25 million changed hands. But in 1901, we had a 3 million share day. Everybody was making money. The steel crowd came to town, a horde of millionaires with no more regard for money than drunken sailors. The only game that satisfied them was the stock market. We had some of the biggest high rollers the street ever saw. John W. Gates, of Bet You a Million fame, and his friends like John A. Drake, Loyal Smith, and the rest, the Reed Leeds Moore crowd, who sold part of their steel holdings, and with the proceeds bought in the open market the actual majority of the stock of the Great Rock Island system, and Schwab and Frick and Phipps and the Pittsburgh Coterie, to say nothing of scores of men who were lost in the shuffle, but would have been called great plungers at any other time. A fellow could buy and sell all the stock there was. Keen made a market for the U.S. steel shares. A broker sold 100,000 shares in a few minutes. A wonderful time. And there were some wonderful winnings. And no taxes to pay on stock sales. And no day of reckoning in sight. 
Of course, after a while, I heard a lot of calamity howling, and the old stager said everybody except themselves had gone crazy. But everybody except themselves was making money. I knew, of course, there must be a limit to the advances and an end to the crazy buying of AOT, any old thing, and I got bearish. But every time I sold, I lost money. And if it hadn't been that I ran darn quick, I'd have lost a heap more. I looked for a break, but I was playing safe making money when I bought and chipping it out when I sold short, so that I wasn't profiting by the boom as much as you'd think when you consider how heavily I used to trade, even as a boy. There was one stock that I wasn't short of, and that was Northern Pacific. My tape reading came in handy. I thought most stocks had been bought to a standstill, but little never behaved as if it were going still higher. We know now that both the common and the preferred were being steadily absorbed by the Kun Loeb Harriman combination. Well, I was long a thousand shares of Northern Pacific Common and held it against the advice of everybody in the office. When it got to about 110, I had 30 points profit and I grabbed it. It made my balance at my brokers nearly $50,000, the greatest amount of money I had been able to accumulate up to that time. It wasn't so bad for a chap who had lost every cent trading in that self-same office a few months before. If you remember, the Harriman crowd notified Morgan and Hill of their intention to be represented in the Burlington Great Northern-Northern Pacific Combination. And then, the Morgan people at first instructed Keene to buy 50,000 shares of MP to keep the control in their possession. I have heard that Keene told Robert Bacon to make the order 150,000 shares, and the bankers did. At all events, Keene sent one of his brokers, Eddie Norton, into the NP crowd, and he bought 100,000 shares of the stock. This was followed by another order, I think uh, 50,000 shares additional, and the famous corner followed. After the market closed on May 8, 1901, the whole world knew that a battle of financial giants was on. No two such combinations of capital had ever opposed each other in this country. Harriman against Morgan. An irresistible force meeting an immovable object. There I was, on the morning of May 9th, with nearly $50,000 in cash and no stocks. As I told you, I had been very bearish for some days, and here was my chance at last. I knew what would happen. An awful break and then some wonderful bargains. There would be a quick recovery and big profits for those who had picked up the bargains. It didn't take a Sherlock Holmes to figure this out. We were going to have an opportunity to catch them coming and going, not only for big money, but for sure money. Everything happened as I had foreseen. I was dead right, and I lost every cent I had. I was wiped out by something that was unusual. If the unusual never happened, there would be no difference in people, and then there wouldn't be any fun in life. The game would become merely a matter of addition and subtraction. It would make of us a race of bookkeepers with plotting minds. It's the guessing that develops a man's brain power. Just consider what you have to do to guess right. The market fairly boiled, as I had expected. The transactions were enormous and the fluctuations unprecedented in extent. I put in a lot of selling orders at the market. When I saw the opening prices, I had a fit. The breaks were so awful. My brokers were on the job. They were as competent and conscientious as any. But by the time they executed my orders, the stocks had broken 20 points more. The tape was way behind the market and reports were slow in coming in by reason of the awful rush of business. When I found out that the stocks I had ordered sold when the tape said the price was, say, 100, and they got mine off at 80, making a total decline of 30 or 40 points from the previous night's close, it seemed to me that I was putting out shorts at a level that made the stocks I sold the very bargains I had planned to buy. The market was not going to drop right through to China. So I decided instantly to cover my shorts and go long. My brokers bought, not at the level that had made me turn, but at the prices prevailing in the stock exchange when their floor man got my orders. They paid an average of 15 points more than I had figured on. A loss of 35 points in one day was more than anybody could stand. The ticker beat me by lagging so far behind the market. I was accustomed to regarding the tape as the best little friend I had, because I bet according to what it told me. But this time, the tape double-crossed me. The divergence between the printed and the actual prices undid me. It was the sublimation of my previous unsuccess, the self-same thing that had beaten me before. It seems so obvious now that tape reading is not enough, irrespective of the broker's execution, that I wonder why it didn't then see both my trouble and the remedy for it.
I did worse than not see him. I kept on trading in and out, regardless of the execution. You see, I never could trade with a limit. I must take my chances with the market. That is what I'm trying to beat, the market, not the particular price. When I think I should sell, I sell. When I think stocks will go up, I buy. My adherence to that general principle of speculation saved me. To have traded at limited prices simply would have been my old bucket shop method inefficiently adapted for use in a reputable commission broker's office. I would have never learned to know what stock speculation is, but would have kept on betting on what a limited experience told me was a sure thing. Whenever I did try to limit the prices in order to minimize the disadvantages of trading at the market when the ticker lagged, I simply found that the market got away from me. This happened so often that I stopped trying. I can't tell you how it came to take me so many years to learn that instead of placing piking bets on what the next few quotations were going to be, my game was to anticipate what was going to happen in a big way. After my May 9th mishap, I plugged along, using a modified but still defective method. If I hadn't made money some of the time, I might have acquired market wisdom quicker. But I was making enough to enable me to live well. I liked friends and a good time. I was living down the Jersey coast that summer, like hundreds of prosperous Wall Street men. My winnings were not quite enough to offset both my losses and my living expenses. I didn't keep on trading the way I did through stubbornness. I simply wasn't able to state my own problem to myself. And, of course, it was utterly hopeless to try to solve it. I harp on this topic so much to show what I had to go through before I got to where I could really make money. My old shotgun and BB shot could not do the work of a high-power repeating rifle against big game. Early that fall, I not only was cleaned out again, but I was so sick of the game I could no longer beat that I decided to leave New York and try something else some other place. I had been trading since my 14th year. I had made my first thousand dollars when I was a kid of 15, and my first 10,000 before I was 21. I had made and lost a $10,000 stake more than once. In New York, I had made thousands and lost them. I got up to $50,000, and two days later that went. I had no other business, and knew no other game. After several years, I was back where I began. No, worse, for I had acquired habits and a style of living that required money. Though that part didn't bother me as much as being wrong so consistently. Chapter 4 Well, I went home, but the moment I was back, I knew that I had one mission in life, and that was to get a stake and go back to Wall Street. That was the only place in the country where I could trade heavily. Someday, when my game was all right, I'd need such a place. When a man is right, he wants to get all that is coming to him for being right. I didn't have much hope, but, of course, I tried to get into the bucket shops again. There were fewer of them, and some of them were run by strangers. Those who remembered me wouldn't give me a chance to show them whether I had gone back as a trader or not. I told them the truth, that I had lost in New York whatever I had made at home, that I didn't know as much as I used to think I did, and that there was no reason why it should not now be good business for them to let me trade with them. But they would. And the new places were unreliable. Their owners thought 20 shares was as much as a gentleman ought to buy if he had any reason to suspect he was going to guess right. I needed the money, and the bigger shops were taking in plenty of it from their regular customers. I got a friend of mine to go into a certain office and trade. I just sauntered in to look them over. I again tried to coax the order clerk to accept a small order, even if it was only 50 shares. Of course, he said no. I had rigged up a code with this friend so that he would buy or sell when and what I told him, but that only made me chicken feed. Then the office began to grumble about taking my friend's orders. Finally, one day, he tried to sell a hundred St. Paul, and they shut down on him. We learned afterward that one of the customers saw us talking together outside and went in and told the office. And when my friend went up to the order clerk to sell that hundred St. Paul, the guy said, We're not taking any selling orders in St. Paul. Not from you. Why? What's the matter, Joe? asked my friend. Nothing doing, that's all, he answered Joe. Isn't that money any good? Look it over. It's all there. And my friend passed over the hundred, my hundred and tens. He tried to look indignant, and I was looking unconcerned. But most of the other customers were getting close to the combatants, as they always did when there was loud talking or the slightest semblance of a scrap between the shop and any customer. They wanted to get a line on the merits of the case in order to get a line on the solvency of the concern. The clerk, Joe, who was a sort of assistant manager, 
came out from behind his cage, walked up to my friend, looked at him, and then looked at me. It's funny, he said slowly. It's damn funny that you never do a single thing here when your friend Livingston isn't around. You just sit and look at the board by the hour, never a peep. But after he comes in, you get busy all of a sudden. Maybe you're acting for yourself, but not in this office anymore. We don't fall for Livingston tipping you off. Well, that stopped my board money. But I had made a few hundred more than I had spent, and I wondered how I could use them. For the need of making enough money to go back to New York with was more urgent than ever. I felt that I would do better the next time. I had had the time to think calmly of some of my foolish place. And then, one can see the whole better when one sees it from a little distance. The immediate problem was to make the new state. One day, I was in a hotel lobby, talking to some fellows I knew who were pretty steady traders. Everybody was talking stock market. I made the remark that nobody could beat the game on account of the rotten execution he got from his brokers, especially when he traded at the market, as I did. A fellow piped up and asked me what particular brokers I meant. I said, the best in the land, and he asked who might they be. I could see he wasn't going to believe I ever dealt with first-class houses, but I said, I mean any member of the New York Stock Exchange. It isn't that they're crooked or careless, but when a man gives an order to buy at the market, he never knows what that stock is going to cost him until he gets a report from the brokers. There are more moves of one or two points than of ten or fifteen, but the outside trader can't catch the small rises or drops because of the execution. I'd rather trade in a bucket shop any day of the week, if they'd only let a fellow trade big. The man who had spoken to me I had never seen before. His name was Roberts. He seemed very friendly disposed. He took me aside and asked me if I've ever traded in any of the other exchanges, and I said no. He said he knew some houses that were members of the Cotton Exchange and the Produce Exchange and the smaller stock exchanges. These firms were very careful and paid special attention to the execution. He said they had confidential connections with the biggest and smartest houses on the New York Stock Exchange and through their personal pool and by guaranteeing a business of hundreds of thousands of shares a month, they got much better service than an individual customer could get. They really cater to the small customer, he said. They make a specialty of out-of-town business, and they take just as much pains with a 10-share order as they do with one for 10000 They're very competent and honest. Yes, but if they pay the stock exchange house the regular 8th commission, where do they come in? Well, they are supposed to pay the 8th, but you know, he winked at me. Yes, I said, but the one thing a stock exchange firm will not do is to split commissions. The governors would rather a member commit murder, arson, and bigamy than to do business for outsiders for less than a kosher eighth. The very life of the stock exchange depends upon their not violating that one rule. He must have seen that I had talked with stock exchange people, for he said, listen, Every now and then, one of those pious stock exchange houses is suspended for a year for violating that rule, isn't it? There are ways and ways of rebating so nobody can squeal. He probably saw unbelief in my face, for he went on. And besides, on certain kind of businesses, we, I mean, these wire houses charge a 30-second extra, in addition to the 8th commission. They're very nice about it. They never charge the extra commission except in unusual cases and then only if the customer has an inactive account. It wouldn't pay them, you know, otherwise. They aren't in business exclusively for their health. By that time, I knew he was touting for some phony brokers. Do you know any reliable house of that kind, I asked him. I know the biggest brokerage firm in the United States, he said. I trade there myself. They have branches in 78 cities in the United States and Canada. They do an enormous business, and they couldn't very well do it year in and year out if they weren't strictly on the level, could they? Certainly not, I agree. Do they trade in the same stocks that are dealt in on the New York Stock Exchange? Of course, and on the curb, and on any other exchange in this country or Europe. They deal in wheat, cotton, provisions, anything you want. They have correspondence everywhere, and memberships in all the exchanges, either in their own name or on the quiet. I knew by that time but I thought I'd lead them on. Yes, I said, but that does not alter the fact that the orders have to be executed by somebody, and nobody living can guarantee how the market will be or how close the ticker's prices are to the actual prices on the floor of the exchange. By the time a man gets the quotation here and hands in an order and it's telegraphed to New York, some valuable time is gone. I might better go back to New York and lose my money there in respectable company. I don't know anything about losing money, 
Our customers don't acquire that habit. They make money. We take care of that. Your customers? Well, I take an interest in the firm. And if I can turn some business their way, I do so. Because they've always treated me white, and I've made a good deal of money through them. If you wish, I'll introduce you to the manager. What's the name of the firm, I asked him. He told me. I had heard about them. They ran ads in all the papers, calling attention to the great profits made by those customers who followed their inside information on active stocks. That was the firm's great specialty. They were not a regular bucket shop, but bucketeers. Alleged brokers who bucketed their orders but nevertheless went through an elaborate camouflage to convince the world that they were regular brokers engaged in a legitimate business. They were one of the oldest of that class of firms. They were the prototype at that time of the same sort of brokers that went broke this year by the dozen. The general principles and methods were the same, though the particular devices for fleecing the public differed somewhat. Certain details having been changed when the old tricks became too well known. These people used to send out tips to buy or sell a certain stock, hundreds of telegrams advising the instant purchase of a certain stock, and hundreds recommending other customers to sell the same stock on the old racing tipster plan. Then orders to buy and sell would come in. The firm would buy and sell, say, a thousand of that stock through a reputable stock exchange firm and get a regular report on it. This report they would show to any doubting Thomas, who was impolite enough to speak about bucketing customers' orders. They also used to form discretionary pools in the office and, as a great favor, allowed their customers to authorize them, in writing, to trade with the customer's money and in the customer's name as they, in their judgment, deemed best. That way, the most cantankerous customer had no legal redress when his money disappeared. They'd bull a stock on paper and put the customers in, and they'd execute one of the old-fashioned bucket shop drives and wipe out hundreds of shoestring margins. They did not spare anyone, women, school teachers, and old men being their best bet. I'm sore on all brokers, I told the tout. I'll have to think this over. And I left so he wouldn't talk anymore to me. I inquired about this firm. I learned that they had hundreds of customers, and although they were the usual stories, I did not find any case of a customer not getting his money from them if he won any. The difficulty was in finding anybody who had ever won in that office, but I did. Things seemed to be going their way just then, and that meant that they would probably not welsh if a trade went against them. Of course, most concerns of that kind eventually go broke. There are times when there are regular epidemics of bucketeering bankruptcies, like the old-fashioned runs on several banks after one of them goes up. The customers of the others get frightened, and they run to take their money out. But there are plenty of retired bucket shopkeepers in this country. Well, I heard nothing alarming about the Touts firm, except that they were on the make, first, last, and all the time, and that they were not always truthful. Their specialty was trimming suckers who wanted to get rich quick. But they always asked their customers' permission, in writing, to take their roles away from them. One chap I met did tell me a story about seeing 600 telegrams go out one day advising customers to get aboard a certain stock, and 600 telegrams to other customers strongly urging them to sell that same stock at once. Yes, I know the trick, I said to the chap who was telling me. Yes, he said, but the next day they sent telegrams to the same people advising them to close out their interest in everything and buy or sell another stock. I asked the senior partner who was in the office, why did they do that? The first part I understand. Some of your customers are bound to make money on paper for a while, even if they and the others eventually lose. But by sending out telegrams like this, you simply kill them all. What's the big idea? Well, he said, the customers are bound to lose their money anyhow, no matter what they buy, or how, or where, or when. When they lose their money, I lose the customers. Well, I might as well get as much of their money as I can and then look for a new crop. Well, I admit frankly that I wasn't concerned with the business ethics of the firm. I told you how I felt sore on the teller concern and how it tickled me to get even with them. But I didn't have any such feelings about this firm. They might be crooks or they might not be as black as they were painted. I did not propose to let them do any trading for me or follow their tips, or believe their lies. My one concern was with getting together a stake and returning to New York to trade in fair amounts in an office where you did not have to be afraid the police would raid the joint, as they did the bucket shops, or see the postal authorities swoop down and tie up your money so that you'd be lucky to get eight cents on the dollar a year and a half later. 
Anyhow, I made up my mind that I would see what trading advantages of this firm offered over what you might call the legitimate brokers. I didn't have much money to put up as margin, and firms that bucketed orders were naturally much more liberal in that respect, so that a few hundred dollars went much further in their offices. I went down to their place and had a talk with the manager himself. When he found out that I was an old trader and had formerly had accounts in New York with stock exchange houses, and that I had lost all I took with me, he stopped promising to make a million a minute for me if I let him invest my savings. He figured that I was a permanent sucker, the ticker hound kind that always plays and always loses, a steady income provider for brokers, whether they were the kind that bucket your orders or modestly content themselves with the commission. I just told the manager that what I was looking for was decent execution, because I always traded at the market and I didn't want to get reports that showed a difference of a half or a whole point from the ticker price. He assured me on his word of honor that they would do whatever I thought was right. They wanted my business because they wanted to show me what high-class brokering was. They had in their employ the best talent in the business. In fact, they were famous for their execution. If there was any difference between the ticker price and the report, it was always in favor of the customer. Though, of course, they didn't guarantee that. If I opened an account with them, I could buy and sell at the price which came over the wire. They were so confident of their brokers. Naturally, that meant that I could trade there to all intents and purposes as though I were in a bucket shop. That is, they let me trade at the next quotation. I didn't want to appear too anxious. So I shook my head and told him I guessed I wouldn't open an account that day, but I'd let him know. He urged me strongly to begin right away, as it was a good market to make money in. It was, for them, a dull market with prices seesawing slightly, just the kind to get customers in and then wipe them out with a sharp drive and the tip stock. I had some trouble in getting away. I had given him my name and address, and that very same day I began to get prepaid telegrams and letters urging me to get aboard of some stock or other in which they said they knew an inside pool was operating for a 50-point rise. I was busy going around and finding out all I could about several other brokerage concerns of the same bucketing kind. It seemed to me that if I could be sure of getting my winnings out of their clutches, the only way of getting together some real money was to trade in these near-bucket shops. When I had learned all I could, I opened accounts with three firms. I had taken a small office and had direct wires run to three brokers. I traded in a small way so they wouldn't get frightened off at the very start. I made money on balance, and they were not slow in telling me that they expected real business from customers who had direct wires to their offices. They did not hanker the pikers. They figured that the more I did, the more I'd lose, and the more quickly I was wiped out, the more they'd make. It was a sound enough theory when you considered that these people necessarily dealt with averages, and the average customer was never long-lived, financially speaking. A busted customer can't trade. A half-crippled customer can whine and insinuate things and make trouble of one or another kind that hurts business. I also established a connection with a local firm that had a direct wire to its New York correspondent, who were also members of the New York Stock Exchange. I had a stock ticker put in, and I began to trade conservatively. As I told you, it was pretty much like trading in bucket shops, only it was a little slower. It was a game that I could beat, and I did. I never got it down to such a fine point that I could win 10 times out of 10, but I won on balance, taking it weeks in and weeks out. I was again living pretty well, but always saving something to increase the stake that I was to take back to Wall Street. I got a couple of wires into two more of these bucketing brokerage houses, making five in all, and, of course, my good firm. There were times when my plans went wrong and my stocks did not run true to form, but did the opposite of what they should have done if they had kept up their regard for precedent. But they did not hit me very hard. They couldn't, with my shoestring margins. My relations with my brokers were friendly enough. Their accounts and records did not always agree with mine, and the differences uniformly happened to be against me. Curious coincidence, not? But I fought for my own and usually had my way in the end. They always had the hope of getting away from me what I had taken from them. They regarded my winnings as temporary loans, I think. They really were not sporty, being in the business to make money by hook or by crook instead of being content with the house percentage. Since suckers always lose money when they gamble in stocks, they never really speculate. You'd think these fellows would run what you might call a legitimate, illegitimate business, but they didn't. 
Copper your customers and grow rich is an old and true adage, but they did not seem ever to have heard of it and didn't stop at plain bucketing. Several times they tried to double cross me with old tricks. They caught me a couple of times because I wasn't looking. They always did that when I had taken no more than my usual line. I accused them of being short sports or worse, but they denied it and it ended by my going back to trading as usual. The beauty of doing business with a crook is that he always forgives you for catching him, so long as you don't stop doing business with him. It's all right as far as he is concerned. He's willing to meet you more than halfway. Magnanimous souls. Well, I made up my mind that I couldn't afford to have the normal rate of increase of my stake impaired by crook's tricks, so I decided to teach them a lesson. I picked out some stock that, after having been a speculative favorite, had become inactive. Waterlogged. If I had taken one that never had been active, they would have suspected my play. I gave out buying orders on this stock to my five bucketeering brokers. When the orders were taken and they were waiting for the next quotation to come out on the tape, I sent in an order through my stock exchange house to sell 100 shares of that particular stock at the market. I urgently asked for quick action. Well, you can imagine what happened when the selling order got to the floor of the exchange. A dull, inactive stock that a commission house with out-of-town connections wanted to sell in a hurry. Somebody got cheap stock. But the transaction, as it would be printed on the tape, was the price that I would pay for my five buying orders. I was long on balance 400 shares of that stock at a low figure. The wirehouse asked me what I'd heard, and I said I had a tip on it. Just before the close of the market, I sent an order to my reputable house to buy back that 100 shares and not waste any time that I didn't want to be short under any circumstances, and I didn't care what they paid. So they wired to New York, and the order to buy that 100 quick resulted in a sharp advance. I, of course, had put in selling orders for the 500 shares that my friends had bucketed. It worked very satisfactorily. Still, they didn't mend their ways, and so I worked that trick on them several times. I did not dare punish them as severely as they deserved, seldom more than a point or two on 100 shares but it helped to swell my little hoard that I was saving for my next Wall Street venture. I sometimes varied the process by selling some stock short, without overdoing it. I was satisfied with my six or eight hundred clear for each crack. One day, the stunt worked so well that it went far beyond all calculations for a ten-point swing. I wasn't looking for it. As a matter of fact, it so happened that I had two hundred shares instead of my usual hundred at one broker's, though only a hundred in the four other shops. That was too much of a good thing for them. They were sore as pups about it, and they began to say things over the wires. So I went and saw the manager, the same man who had been so anxious to get my account, and so forgiving every time I caught him trying to put something over on me. He talked pretty big for a man in his position. That was a fictitious market for that stock, and we won't pay you a damn cent, he swore. It wasn't a fictitious market when you accepted my order to buy. You let me in then, all right, and now you've got to let me out. You can't get around that for fairness, can you? Yes, I can, he yelled. I can prove that somebody put up a job. Who put up a job, I asked. Somebody. Who did they put it up on, I asked. Some friends of yours were in it as sure as pop, he said. But I told him, you know very well that I play a lone hand. Everybody in this town knows that. They've known it ever since I started trading in stocks. Now, I want to give you some friendly advice. You just send and get that money for me. I don't want to be disagreeable. Just do what I tell you. I won't pay it. It was a rigged up transaction, he yelled. I got tired of his talk, so I told him, you'll pay it to me right now in here. Well, he blustered me a little more and accused me flatly of being the guilty thimble rigger, but he finally forked over the cash. The others were not so rambunctious. In one office, the manager had been studying these inactive stock plays of mine, and when he got my order, he actually bought the stock for me, and then some for himself in the little board and he made some money. These fellows didn't mind being sued by customers on charges of fraud, as they generally had a good technical legal defense ready, but they were afraid I'd attach the furniture of the money in the bank. I couldn't, because they took care not to have any funds exposed to that danger. It would not hurt them to be known as pretty sharp, but to get a reputation for Welshing was fatal. For a customer to lose money at his brokers is no rare event. But for a customer to make money and then not get it is the worst crime on the speculator's statute books. I got my money from all, but that 10-point jump put an end to the pleasing pastime of skinning skinners.
They were on the lookout for the little trick that they themselves had used to defraud hundreds of poor customers. I went back to my regular trading, but the market wasn't always right for my system. That is, limited as I was by the size of my orders they would take, I couldn't make a killing. I had been at it over a year, during which I used every device that I could think of to make money trading in those wirehouses. I had lived very comfortably, bought an automobile, and didn't limit myself about my expenses. I had to make a stake, but I also had to live while I was doing it. If my position on the market was right, I couldn't spend as much as I made, so that I'd always be saving some. If I was wrong, I didn't make any money and therefore couldn't spend. As I said, I had saved up a fair-sized roll, and there wasn't so much money to be made in the five wirehouses. So, I decided to return to New York. I had my own automobile, and I invited a friend of mine who also was a trader to motor to New York with me. He accepted, and we started. We stopped at New Haven for dinner. At the hotel, I met an old trading acquaintance, and among other things, he told me there was a shop in town that had a wire and was doing a pretty good business. We left the hotel on our way to New York, but I drove by the street where the bucket shop was to see what the outside looked like. We found it and couldn't resist the temptation to stop and have a look at the inside. It wasn't very sumptuous, but the old blackboard was there, and the customers, and the game was on. The manager was a chap who looked as if he had been an actor or a stump speaker. He was very impressive. He'd say good morning as though he had discovered the morning's goodness after ten years of searching for it with a microscope and was making you a present of the discovery as well as of the sky, the sun, and the firm's bankroll. He saw us come up in the sporty-looking automobile, and as both of us were young and careless, I don't suppose I looked twenty, he naturally concluded we were a couple of Yale boys. I didn't tell him we weren't. He didn't give me a chance, but began delivering a speech. He was very glad to see us. Would we have a comfortable seat? The market, we would find, was philanthropically inclined that morning. In fact, clamoring to increase the supply of collegiate pocket money, of which no intelligent undergraduate ever had a sufficiency since the dawn of historic time. But here and now, by the beneficence of the ticker, a small initial investment would return thousands. More pocket money than anybody could spend was what the stock market yearned to yield. Well, I thought it would be a pity not to do as the nice man of the bucket shop was so anxious to have us do. So I told him I would do as he wished, because I had heard that lots of people made lots of money in the stock market. I began to trade very conservatively, but increasing the line as I won. My friend followed me. We stayed overnight in New Haven, and the next morning found us at the hospitable shop at five minutes to ten. The orator was glad to see us, thinking his turn would Coney Day. But I cleaned up within a few dollars of fifteen hundred. The next morning, when we dropped in on the great orator and handed him an order to sell five hundred sugar, he hesitated, but finally accepted it in silence. The stock broke over a point, and I closed out and gave him the ticket. It was exactly five hundred dollars coming to me in profits, and my five hundred dollar margin. He took twenty fifties from the safe, counted them three times very slowly, then counted them again in front of me. It looked as if his fingers were sweating mucilage, the way the notes seemed to stick to him. But finally, he handed the money to me. He folded his arms, bit his lower lip, kept it bit, and stared at the top of the window behind me. I told him I'd like to sell 200 steel, but he never stirred. He didn't hear me. I repeated my wish, only I made it 300 shares. He turned his head. I waited for the speech, but all he did was to look at me. Then he smacked his lips and swallowed as if he was going to start an attack on 50 years of political misrule by the unspeakable grafters of the opposition. Finally, he waved his hand toward the yellow backs of my hand and said, Take away that babble. Take away what? I said. I hadn't quite understood what he was driving at. Where are you going, student? He spoke very impressively. New York, I told him. That's right, he said, nodding about 20 times. That is exactly right. You're going away from here, all right, because now I know two things. Two, student. I know what you are not, and I know what you are. Yes, yes, yes. Is that so? I said very politely. Yes, you too, he paused. And then he stopped being in Congress and snarled. You two are the biggest sharks in the United States of America. Students, yeah. You must be freshmen, yeah. We left him talking to himself. He probably didn't mind the money so much. No professional gambler does. 
It's all in the game, and the luck's bound to turn. It was his being fooled in us that hurt his pride. That is how I came back to Wall Street for a third attempt. I had been studying, of course, trying to locate the exact trouble with my system that had been responsible for my defeats in A.R. Fullerton and company's offense. I was 20 when I made my first 10000 and I lost that. But I knew how and why, because I traded out of season all the time. Because when I couldn't play according to my system, which was based on study and experience, I went in and gambled. I hoped to win, instead of knowing that I ought to win on form. When I was about 22, I ran up my stake to $50,000. I lost it on May 9th. But I knew exactly why and how. It was the laggard tape and the unprecedented violence of the movements that awful day. But I didn't know why I had lost after my return from St. Louis, or after the May 9th panic. I had theories, that is, remedies, for some of the faults that I thought I found in my play. But I needed actual practice. There's nothing like losing all you have in the world for teaching you what not to do. And when you know what not to do in order not to lose money, you begin to learn what to do in order to win. Did you get that? You begin to learn.